there, my name is Lee Eric Fesco. I'm the director of discipleship here at Christ Presbyterian Church. Melanie Rayner and I are walking you through the study signs of the Savior, understanding the miracles of Jesus. And this is week eight, the final week in our study. And today's topic is Lazarus raised from the dead. Now, I know you might approach this one with a fairly confident understanding of what this miracle is all about. And you're probably not wrong. Most of us who have read this account understand that, that this event points us to the fact that Jesus, without question, has power over death. And if that's your understanding of this miracle, well, you're not wrong. You're right. In fact, the miracle played a major part in how the triumphal entry unfolded, uh, which happened right after this event. The raising of Lazarus was very public. In, in fact, it, it scared many of the religious leaders of the day because if word gets out about this, Rome, who was in charge, would hear about this and, and they'll come to take away our positions and, and the seats we occupy, and we can't have that. In fact, after this, they plotted to kill Jesus and Lazarus. So yes, this miracle shows us that, that Jesus has power over death. But what else does it show us? Think all the way back to the beginning of this study. Uh, we said Jesus never did a miracle for the sake of doing a miracle. There was always a message behind the miracle. And we asked in the intro, what does the miracle teach us? Does it announce the arrival of the kingdom of grace as foretold by the prophets? Does it announce uh, or does it foreshadow how Christ will ultimately undo the effects of the fall? Does it tell us of the benefits of what Christ would accomplish on the cross? Or does it proclaim that Jesus is the undeniable Son of God? Well, we might be able to answer yes to all those questions with this miracle. Let's check it out. We learn at the start of this chapter that a friend of Jesus named Lazarus was very ill. His sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus. Jesus, the one you love is ill. Now, why did they do that? Why did they send word to Jesus that Lazarus was ill? Because they knew what he could do. They knew he, he had the ability to do something about Lazarus' illness. Jesus, Lazarus is suffering. Are you going to do something about it? So Jesus gets word that Lazarus is ill. He, he's a good distance away, but if he gets going now, uh, maybe he'll get there in time to do something about Lazarus. So, so what does Jesus do? John tells us that Jesus decides to stay two days longer in the place where he was. What? But Jesus, your friend Lazarus, he's dying. Then Jesus says, hey, I've got an idea. Let's go to Judea. And the disciples all but tell him next, are you crazy, Jesus? That's where you just were. Remember, you were just there, and they tried to kill you there. And now you want to go back. Hey, Jesus, remember your friend Lazarus. He's dying. Remember that? Do you see, this isn't unlike suffering of our own. Have you noticed that? We suffer as a result of the fall. Suffering is a byproduct of the fall. So not unlike those in this account, we say to him, Jesus, I'm suffering. Why are you allowing this suffering? You see me suffering. You see that I'm in pain. And, and Jesus, you're not doing anything. Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you moving? Put yourself in the shoes of, of Mary and Martha. Lazarus, sure, he's suffering. Maybe, maybe he's out of it. Uh, but look at Mary and Martha. They're suffering too. They see their brother. They see he's about to die. And the one person they know that can do something about it seems to be dragging his feet. Jesus, you could snap your fingers and take this all away, yet he doesn't. After his disciples protest, Jesus tells them this in verse 11, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Listen, you guys, you're not following me. Lazarus is dead. I've stayed here long enough to let Lazarus get all the way to the point of death. And then he tells them, verse 15, And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, that you may believe. But let us go to him. Now, if we're being honest, that word, glad, that might rub us the wrong way. Jesus, you're glad you're not there to tend to Lazarus' suffering? 
hold on to that thought for a moment and hold on to the word glad. Jesus goes on to say, for your sake, for your faith, this suffering has gone this far for your sake, for the, for the strengthening of your faith. When Jesus got to be about two miles away from where Lazarus was, he gets word that he's died and he's been dead for four days. Martha meets him there and tells him, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus, you could have stopped this. You could have stopped this suffering and you didn't. And Jesus tells her, oh, Martha, your brother will rise again. And then he says in verses 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And isn't that line curious? Everyone who lives in me, uh, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Shall never die. I think you probably know how the story goes from here. Spoiler alert. Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus will weep at the tomb of Lazarus, angry at death. He shakes his fist and, and raises Lazarus from the dead. Now again, keep hanging on to that word glad, remember? He was glad he wasn't there and, and he's angry at death and he weeps at the tomb of Lazarus, but nevertheless, he raises him from the dead. He's alive. Lazarus lives. He did it. He did it. It's done. Now, here's what I find interesting about that. Yes, this is certainly a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do at his own resurrection, but here's the line that I can't get past. Everyone who believes in me shall never die. Everyone who believes in me shall never die. Here's what I find interesting about that line. Yes, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but guess what? Eventually, he died again. He probably lived several more years after this incident, and then after some time, he probably got old and died again. What was the point of that? Why raise Lazarus from the dead if he's only going to die again later? Because maybe Jesus was trying to tell us something here. Maybe Jesus is trying to tell us something not of just Lazarus's destiny, but yours as well. Maybe Jesus is telling us something of where all of this suffering is headed. Maybe he's giving us a faint echo of, of what's to become of all suffering. Maybe he's telling us something of the destiny of the effects of the fall. And maybe it's this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the, right, uh, seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. In this moment here with Lazarus, this is what Jesus is telling us. Yes, there is suffering now. And yes, I have power over this vile intruder we call death. And yes, I will silence death. But I won't just silence death. I'm going to undo death. I'm going to make you new again. I, I'm going to unwind the clock of sin's curse. I'm going to, I'm going to reverse sin's curse. And, and what was made wrong, I'm going to reverse it and make it right. I'm going to make all things new again. Now, let's bring back the word glad. Jesus, whatever do you mean? Why would you be glad for any reason at any point that Lazarus would suffer? Imagine if Lazarus didn't die. Imagine, imagine if Jesus did get there in time and he healed Lazarus before he died. Now, that would still be miraculous. That would still be unbelievable, wouldn't it? But instead, he let him die so that you may believe. In other words, your faith, this is what Jesus is saying here, your faith is going to be made stronger as a result of the events that are about to transpire. And what Jesus is saying with this word glad is that somehow, someway, you're going to have a better understanding, a better appreciation, a more glorious understanding of what redemption is. And, and, and you're going to understand it even better for having been through the suffering than if you hadn't been through the suffering. When Jesus comes to undo the effects of the fall and make all things new again, we will love it all the more for having been through it than if we hadn't. Can you really appreciate a, a cold glass of water if you've never experienced thirst? You see, 
He doesn't keep you from thirsting, but he will not only take away the thirst, but undo its effects and see to it that you never thirst again. But let's not forget, Jesus wept. And we do too. The hope we carry with us of the resurrection, the hope of all things new, doesn't minimize the pain of the moment. We live with this already not yet tension. We still feel sin's effects, but Jesus has given us definitive hope. Because His kingdom is already the signs of our Savior prove it. His kingdom is here. We have it, and we have hope throughout the not yet. Thanks for being with us, and may God bless you all. Thanks for joining us on this study. Enjoy your discussion.